invitation. Thanks for the invitation. It's such a pleasure to be back and I miss you guys all so much. You know, <laughs> just the SSP coffee in the or our coffee in the morning is one thing that I haven't figured out how to implement here. We have a monthly coffee at the CSI, but it's just not the same without Andreas cookies or some of the other delights that we're bringing in for discussions in the morning. But what I'd like to do today is I'd like to talk a little bit about how to find life on exoplanets, challenges, ideas, and adventures. That's what I came up with when I got the invitation. And then I was told it's 25 minutes. So basically what you're gonna get is a challenge, ideas, and an adventure. Everything else you can ask me in the question and answer period. There's more challenges, there are more ideas, there are more adventures out there, but I'll try to keep to the time that I was allocated for. So let me just give you a very short intro to the Carl Sagan Institute that Evan was talking about. So we founded it about six years ago here at Cornell. It's currently 35 faculty and senior researchers in them, researchers, postdocs, students, undergrad from 15 departments at Cornell that make up this interdisciplinary team. So you're going all the way as normally, you know, from engineering, biology, astronomy, earth and atmospheric science, but also to science communication, music, performing arts. So we're trying to span the whole arch. And this is just a couple of the picture of people here. And as Evan was saying, what we're trying to do is to create the toolkit to find life in the cosmos, in the solar system and outside of it. So as Cornell has a really strong uh, history of actually having planetary and astronomy together, our department is planetary and astronomy. So Mars and everything is actually not in Earth and planetary science here. It's actually in astronomy. But Earth and atmospheric science, as it's called here, is also a strong part of what we're trying to figure out from climate change to other Earth-like planets. All of this is built together to figure out how to find life on solar system bodies and also on bodies further away, exoplanets. What's my research, what I'm gonna talk about today. So this is a little bit of a tour of the force. So what I wanted to give you is in case you're interested in some of the uh, latest updates, this is a review that I wrote in 2007 on how to characterize habitable worlds and signs of life with all the caveats that entails, right? So I'll talk about a couple of these today in my talk. And then again, feel free to uh, reach out and ask questions. So the prime challenge where I want to start all of this is actually identifying a habitable world. And you all know that we have found more than 4,000 planets so far, most of them in systems. And this is an updated image. And so thanks to Sam Quinn that actually updated it since my review for me. So you see the radius of the planets that we found versus the periods in Bay. That's usually how you see it. And then also what I put here is the effective temperature of the planet, because that, of course, goes in into how much radiation irradiation hits that world. And here, just a couple of lines as a guideline, Mars, Earth, Neptune, Jupiter. And you all know somewhere between Earth and Neptune is where we find most of the planets. But if we turn this around, and again, Sam was incredibly kind to actually update all these images for me with the arrow bars that we know of. So you have the mass and the radius now, and this is the irradiation. The color coding is the irradiation, how much stellar light hits the planet. And the question you're asking is if you see patterns. And again, we have about 4,000 objects so far that are transiting planets. But if you go down where you want to have the mass and the radius, you get a little bit more sparse in how many planets we have. However, you kind of see uh, groupings appearing. Again, we'll probably want to have more planets. But the question that came up is whether or not there are two population of these extrasolar planets, the big ones that are mostly hot, because again, bias in the observation, anything as close to a star is easier to find. And then there's this really intriguing group of small planets. And so what I mean by that is if you actually just zoom in and you have a look at mass versus radius, and now we're in Earth's radius. So I already threw all the giant planets out, you know, so many Neptunes are still in there, but now I'm concentrating on planets that could potentially be rocks and could potentially be habitats. And we'll talk about that a little later. So this is what we have so far. V and E stand for Venus and Earth. 
And then here are some guidelines of a mean density line. So this is 100% iron. This is the earth-like composition in green here. And then you have 50% water here and 100% water here. And the idea is that anything that is above this turquoise or light blue line here, 100% of water, actually needs a lot of hydrogen to make for its radius. For the certain mass that you have, to get that radius, you have to have gas. So that line basically moves you anything above that, probably also a little bit below that, is actually uh, a mini nebula or something with a lot of gas. And in my talk, I will make the distinction of rocky worlds as rocks that outgas their atmosphere, like the Earth. And then mini Neptunes or gaseous worlds, whatever you want to call it, as some that start with a big primordial hydrogen atmosphere that again will then make up this radio difference, this big radius. So when you look at this, and I discussed this a little bit more in the review, you can eyeball it, right? Yes, you should do it statistically, and a lot of good people have done it statistically, and they they kind of you know they, they find really good uh, answers that are still shifting. But if you eyeball it, you see that roughly below two Earth radii, we don't know of a planet, we haven't found one yet, where we actually know that it is uh, a mini Neptune, okay? Radius wise. When you have a look at the mass, there doesn't seem to be any mass limit, like maybe around two Earth masses below which we haven't found any kind of gaseous small worlds. So radius seems to be more helpful. And that's really great because a lot of our observations are transits where we get the radius. So the discussion in the literature goes between the 1.6 and 2 Earth radii line. And it's going back and forth. It depends on which models you're using. It depends on what statistics you're using, if you use a patient approach, and so on and so forth. Uh, but, uh, and a lot of this is, is this one data point here. So, uh, but below 1.6 Earth radius, we do not know uh, of any planet that's definitely not a rock so far. Uh, below 2 Earth radius should be safe. It's somewhere between 1.9 and 1.6 if you go through the current literature. Okay, so. We want to have a planet that's most likely a rock. So somewhere between 2 and 1.6 or lower in radius. Then what can we do? OK, so we look at these planets. We've identified them. Then the next concept, the next idea that we bring in here is actually a concept of what we call the habitable zone. It's pretty badly named just to go with that, because it doesn't mean that this is the zone where there can be habitable conditions. It just means that this is the zone if you have a planet like the Earth, roughly its mass, a rock that outgasses an atmosphere, then actually with the certain luminosity from the star at the certain distance, you can get liquid water on the surface of that planet, from all we know. If you get too close, you start to evaporate all the water, it gets too hot, too far away, it gets too cold. There will be some caveats I get to. So this is the, the simple intro. But basically this idea of a habitable zone is really a tool for mission, for prioritization of planet detection or planet analysis characterization. Because if you have liquid body of water on the surface, then if there is life and it produces gases, it should be able to go in the air easily. And the only thing that we can access remotely because we can't fly there is actually the atmosphere of another planet. Maybe the surface, but that will be much harder. So the atmosphere, the gases in the atmosphere is what we stuck with or what the amazing approach we have is to actually read or analyze the atmosphere of the gases off another planet. And so how do you figure out what these habitable zone limits should be? So you have to explore a parameter space. And here I was talking about you can explore it in 1D or in 2D models, 3D models from a theoretical perspective. And so one of the most effective ways to actually explore a wide parameter space, again, there'll be some caveats, is actually to use a 1D model. And the way that we do it, and there are several teams that I, I show below, but basically the way that we do it, starting from Casting's work in um, the, six, the 70s, is actually that we assume that you have a 1D model 
What that means is that you have a surface of a planet and then you assume that the temperature is basically evenly distributed around that planet, kind of. And then you have uh, different um, levels in height. And usually we run this with about 50 levels of uh, atmospheric layers. And so what happens is that this actually reproduces the Earth really well. The average temperature profile of the Earth really well. Also works really great for Mars. Works pretty well for Venus for the part above the clouds. So, so far you should be okay. One of the things that it won't work for really well is if you have, for example, a tightly locked planet where one part of the planet gets incredible amounts of heat and the other one does not. Depending on how dense your atmosphere is, if it can actually transport the heat to the other side or not, that again will change whether or not you can make that assumption. But let's take tightly locked planets aside for now. I promise I'll get back to that and say, okay, so on average, those planets that are not synchronously locked, you should be able to analyze with a 1D model to explore a wide parameter space. And with that, you get some limits to the so-called habitable cell. Where do you start to evaporate all the water? So what you see here is the stellar temperature of the star, of the host star, and down here so you see the effective stellar flux, incident flux. And this is from my review, there are a couple of more planets now in it, but basically you see that we have about three dozen planets that are within these limits of the so-called habitable zone. There's a dotted line here, that is actually where our models would say it gets too hot, but the problem is these models, whether it's 1D or to a certain point 3D, actually don't have a good cloud feedback mechanism. What I mean by that is if the planet gets a lot hotter, we do not know if the clouds get a lot puffier or if they get if they change in height, how they change in height. We can model it, whether or not it gives the correct answer is another question. So we have an idea of what these modeling uh, limits are for where a planet like the Earth can keep liquid water on the surface. And what we really, or what I generally tend to use is actually an empirical uh, model. And the empirical model is based on an early Venus and an early Mars. The flux the Mars received when we know it didn't have any uh, water on its, on its surface anymore and the flux Venus received. There are a lot of uncertainties there, right? Because we don't understand the uh, evolution of Venus very well. So it could well be that it lost water immediately after, it's, uh, after it was born. But those empirical limits get you out of the problem of modeling the space. So let's say there are conservative limits that come from a 1D model that say here all the atmosphere will freeze out, that's the outer edge, and here all the atmosphere will evaporate, that's the inner edge. But those are very conservative, again, because we don't have a good feedback of the clouds. If you could put like a lot of clouds on the inner edge, then you can just push the planet inward, 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 because clouds reflect a lot. So some caveats, but I think this empirical limit based on Venus and young Venus and young Earth, uh, young Mars, is basically a wide limit. Somewhere between the empirical and the conservative limit is probably where a planet will lose all its water. And it will depend on how the clouds behave and it will depend on the rotation rate of the planet. But let's just have a look at this. Let me just go a little bit further into this. This classical habitable zone defined a long time ago. The standard paper is the 1993 by casting it all that started this. So it really depends because what the standard paper did is it used, and it should, right, like the Earth, uh, nitrogen, CO2, and water atmosphere. And so you can extend this limit outwards quite, at, quite easily if you just add, for example, a lot of hydrogen in it. That was a paper by Pierre Humbert and Guidos. But how do you keep that hydrogen there? How do you not just lose it? So what we thought about is that, well, if you have volcanism that produces that hydrogen, it will be sustainable. And with that, you see that the habitable zone actually can move a little bit outwards. But it's kind of good news for direct imaging planets, because the further away you can make a habitable planet from its host star, the easier it will be to actually directly image it, because the brightness of the host star is one of the big problems. But 
I just wanted to throw another idea in there. And uh, the hydrogen sustainable volcanic sink early Mars, where we think there was a lot of volcanism probably producing a lot of hydrogen, a reduced environment, no oxygen yet. But what about if you throw another greenhouse gas in? This is this discussion about early Mars that actually comes into exoplanets here. If you put in methane, for example, that should also heat your atmosphere, it actually does it depending on the SED of your star. So if you have a hot star, FGK, yes, it does extend your habitable zone outwards. But if you have a cooler star like an M star, it actually reverses. It starts to heat the upper atmosphere instead of the lower atmosphere. So it actually starts to truncate the habitable zone width for these uh, M star planets. So just to be careful which greenhouse gas you throw in there, because not all greenhouse gases will do the same because the spectral energy distribution of the star is key. So the, the, the interaction between light and the atmosphere is actually key to figure out what could make a habitable world. And of course, the SED and the luminosity of the star actually changes with its age. And so this is one of the adventures that I promised. So what about a habitable world around an evolved star? Maybe a melted icy moon and melted icy worlds. Could there be signs of life on those? And so if you trace out the habitable sound through time, you actually see that because of the evolution of our star, right? You actually start to get in a couple of billion years, you know, to, uh, to the regions of Jupiter and Saturn. So you should be able to unfreeze those icy moons. Again, this is a digression, but just to think about that, of course, this is all part of time and the evolution of a star. And so, the second point that I wanted to mention is, okay, we only have Earth. So Earth has to be a key to try to find life on other planets. And so the idea here is to generate a spectral fingerprint of a habitable world or habitable planet. This is what the focus of my research generally is. So first, is the Earth spectra unique? Because if it's not, if other planets that don't have life actually uh, show that, then it's not gonna be helped. So if we compare the Earth's spectrum as the blue line to Venus and Mars here, and this is low resolution, okay? So you only see abundant chemicals in the atmosphere. You see that Venus and Mars, so is CO2. This is the infrared region and the visible looks a little bit different, uh, but Earth actually shows water as well, ozone, and here's another methane feature. So yes, the Earth's spectra so far is unique. And so what we did is we created a context so we created a spectral catalog for reference spectra and albedo of 17 objects, uh, the most diverse objects we could come up with in our solar system. So if you want a spectral catalog or comparison, you can just get that down from the Carl Sagan Institute Cornell edu slash data to use. And I was talking about time. So the Earth, of course, changed through time. And I wanted to bring this in because this was the first paper I wrote, like the first real paper I wrote at the CFA with Wes Trout and Ken Jux. And so basically we thought about how the spectral fingerprint of the world changed through geological time. And so if you think about the world in a 24 hour clock, then about, uh, well, about 3.9 billion years ago as the original life, 3 a.m. in the morning, but only about lunchtime, about 2.3, 2.5 billion years ago, you have oxygen building up in the atmosphere. That's of course a very different kind of planet. So if you go back and forth, you have also different kind of life that that enables or whichever hypothesis you go with, the life then also changes the planet. And so all of this you can see in the spectral fingerprint. And what I'm showing you here is from a very recent paper. This is the transit spectra of a modern Earth, of uh, Earth about 0.8 billion years ago, and a prebiotic Earth. And so you see some changes, especially the ozone feature here. And so what we're trying to figure out if we can use our Earth as a template to identify, A, whether or not there are signs of life on another planet, what evolutionary stage is in, because there's enough to say that everything evolves at the same time or at the same time scale. And also to kind of identify which features you should be looking for or could be looking for in the search. <laughs>
And of course, there's the visible, there's the near infrared, and there's the infrared. So each of these wavelengths actually show you differences in uh, the spectral fingerprint. And this is all during a transit. We also have it for a direct image uh, planet, but this is what we generally gonna do with James Webb Space Telescope, and then when the ELT comes in line too. So the opportunity here is the small stars. And so while the small stars have a really possible high UV activity, that's one of the big problems, the contrast ratio is amazing. The contrast ratio helps us find these planets and also characterize the atmospheres. And we looked into whether or not it's really that bad in terms of UV radiation on a planet orbiting such a star. And so what we found is actually, yes, it's really bad compared, compared to current Earth that has an ozone layer, but it's actually not that bad compared to a young Earth that didn't have an ozone layer and thus also had a lot of UV radiation on the ground. And there is some amazing work by Dimitri Saslov and others that actually show that probably for the evolution of life to get it started, you want a certain amount of UV radiation to actually make the, uh, the chemical reactions more efficient. And so this opportunity, of course, resulted in the launch of the amazing test mission uh, in 2018. And here you see happy science team members who were really excited that this thing didn't explode. So that's my first launch ever, but it was super exciting. And especially our small mission that can has more than a thousand planetary candidates right now. We have like about 50 confirmed planets. What was the goal of the test mission? And if you look at the data, just from the primary mission of the first two years, we've actually observed, or TESS has actually observed about 4,000 stars long enough that it should be able to find planets in an Earth's analog orbit. What I mean by that is getting the same irradiation. And it has observed a couple of hundred stars so that you should be able to find planets or see planets throughout the whole habitable zone. So that's another paper that just came out on the revised test habitable zone catalog. Feel free to ask me, all of this is online too, if you have questions. And so the last adventure uh, in my last one minute or two is actually, what about if we go with this time even further? I talked about red giants and maybe there's like melted icy worlds, but what TESS gave us, what's really, really interesting is it actually found the first planet around the white dwarf. And that is a big giant planet. So we have no idea really how it got there. There's a lot of good ideas that it maybe was further out first and then started to actually come closer and closer in. But if there's a giant planet, it should be much easier that at least the theory to actually survive a habitable rocky planet around such a white dwarf. We haven't found one yet, but I promise test is looking. And so this would be an amazing opportunity because when uh, M stars help us a lot, right? Because of the contrast ratio, because they're not as big compared to Earth like planets, a white dwarf is a whooping signal because a white dwarf is roughly the same size as the Earth, a little bit bigger. What's really interesting is that if you do the spectra of a white dwarf planet, like this is potentially like a planet like the Earth, if you put it in the habitable zone of a white dwarf, and there were lots of people who worked on this, I thought about this before, like Eric Eagle uh, and then Avi, and we have worked on what the atmosphere really would be like because a white dwarf is very different in terms of SED than a sun-like star. But there are signatures that you could look for. And it is quite interesting. These do not take into account that actually you only going to see part of the uh, white dwarf being occulted all the time, right? Because it's pretty cool. It's so small that you have to actually change your transit code, your geometry, because you cannot just assume that it will be always illuminated at the same time. So that's an adventure. And of course, what's really interesting is what would that tell us about the tenacity of life? if we found signs of life in the atmosphere of a white dwarf planet, you know, whether it's second genesis, first genesis, or it might just be a wasteland, who knows? But the interesting thing is that the signal to noise should be there for us to figure out what the composition of such planets are. And so with that, 
I just wanted to give you a view. This is the people who helped me do this. This is part of my team. And Asafan Lin just moved to MIT. So you're going to see him more often because he's now at MIT. And I think I'm, oh, I'm at 26 minutes. I'm just basically going to say that Evan was one minute to introduce me. And so as my conclusion is in the search for how it works, we have an incredible diversity of worlds. The challenge is trying to identify planets that could potentially be habitats. And again, I need remote detectable habitable signals. So I'm looking for rocky worlds at a certain distance that they're not completely frozen over and that they haven't lost all that water because subsurface life is exciting, but not easy to find if you can't go there and dig a hole or drill a hole in the ice, right? So I have a very specific parameter that I'm looking for. So JWC and ELTs, uh, of course, I'm including the GMT here, are our first chance to find signs of life. It's going to be extremely tough. The signal to noise is going to be hard. Earth is our key, diverse biota, and you have to think of it through geological time. It's not much, but it's way better than just thinking of the Earth right now trying to find life. Okay. And then there are lots of ideas, like, for example, what life could do in really harsh UV environments. Uh, what about really young or really evolved host stars? And then I just put your idea here, because I hope that's how we're going to launch into our questions. But if you are interested, or if you're an observer and you want the spectral database of models, so you can actually figure out how to retrieve this, at the Carl Sagan Institute, cornell.edu slash data, we have these spectral databases for different kinds of worlds around different stars, around white dwarfs, around whatever you want, kind of, we're building it up, uh, in a resolution of about 100,000 and more. So you can work on the GMT ELTs and you can work on GMT with that. And if you don't find something that you want, just send me an email. That's my address. And then you can also follow the Carl Sagan Institute on Twitter. We have actually quite good Twitter uh, team uh, trying to find out interesting things and highlight them. And I think with that, I will end and ask for questions. Thank you so much. Lisa. All right, yeah, thank you, Lisa. Uh, just remind everyone again, go ahead and uh, send me your questions as this uh, discussion goes on. I think we're gonna start with a question from Morgan. So go ahead, Morgan. Yeah, so, I mean, this is amazing. And I loved thinking through as you were talking, what it might mean to like, think of scenarios that aren't necessarily more common, but are higher signal, if that makes sense, um, like the white dwarf case. And so, Thinking a little bit more about the white dwarf case where there's a lot of potentially a lot of higher energy um, radiation coming in. Um, in some cases, we might expect that to be kind of like boiling off the atmosphere or leading to some evaporation. Is there ever a situation that you can imagine where some of those biosignatures could survive that outflow? And if they're like outflowing, then do we get a bigger covering fraction or, you know what I mean? So it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would thought maybe you could talk a little bit about all of that. Absolutely. So once we found, so Andrew Vandenberg is the first author of our discovery yeah. paper for, uh, for that uh, planet, that it's a giant planet was the surprise. Because if it's a giant planet and it would have, it, there's no way it can have stayed there. Right. while this thing exploded, right? There's just no way. So what that means is it had to come from somewhere. It's also really hard to just catch a giant planet that flies by, right, if we go with that scenario. So that's not going to work either. It's not a rough, it's not a rogue planet. So now they're really interesting work, you know, by, by several formation teams that are suggesting that this planet was out further first, survived the explosion, and then the interaction of the explosion with the planet made it migrate inwards. And the good thing, this is part to your question, is the good thing is that that takes time. And so if you put this together, you have this really, really hot white dwarf initially. But at that point, the planet is still far out because it hasn't started to move in substantially yet. So they think it will take about I can't remember what the latest says, but it, it will take the time until the, the white dwarf uh, cools down to about 7,000 Kelvin, maybe 6,000 Kelvin, hmm. for the planet to start migrating in. And again, 
this is where we probably want to start into this whole problem of migration one, two, three, right? And whether that applies to white dwarfs in the first place. Uh, but if there's really this buffer zone, that means that the planet comes in later. And the other idea is also, so if you had a smaller planet, then even if it is, uh, is also moving in, right, it could actually lose part of its atmosphere through kind of drag, it's kind of, it's not completely clear why it goes in, it could get a bombardment, a secondary heavy bombardment from stuff that was left over on the outside, right? Mm -hmm. And so this question of how that planet can be there is huge because nobody really expected the giant planet of all cases there. Like maybe, you know, from the pulsar planets, maybe people were thinking, well, maybe in that white world, we still could still have some rocks going back and forth. But to have like a bona fide big giant planet is um, what's not in the cards at all. And so the interesting thing is then, uh, as you were saying, the second part, I think if you evaporate a planet, like seriously, if, if the planet were there, a rocky planet, and the white dwarf with the, the star would explode, somehow the planet would survive, but it would get baked with the radiation of you know, 10,000 and 9,000 Kelvin optics. So I think that will be uh, detrimental to life. While I'm saying that is that there is life at about a kilometer or more below the surface of the Earth. So you could argue that maybe that kind of life would actually be able to either go dormant or uh, not care so much. It really depends on how far you get down and if you start to melt <laughs> things. To sterilize the planet, you really have to melt the whole thing kind of down to a couple of kilometers down. So tenacity of life, yes, potentially. But the good thing is because we have a giant planet there that tells you that it has to come in late, this planet. And so if it has to come in late, then now, interesting question, what about an icy world out there? Make it a moon, make it a rocky planet, right? And it's melting on its way in, making it into like a water world, making it into whatever you want, you know? Maybe, and this is like complete speculation, right? So maybe <laughs> you have life that develops in the subsurface frozen ocean, and mm -hmm. then it gets uncovered when it gets melt, molten, right? So that's the whole idea with the red giant phase too. You don't yeah. have to start life during that time. You can just uncover it. And mm. so I don't think there's something like a, a comet kind of like tail when you basically evaporate the whole thing. And so uh, you would have a big surface. I don't think that's going to happen, but Interesting. we have a good chance of this being late. Amazing. Yeah, it looks like Gary had a quick comment related to this. So go ahead, Gary. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, Lisa, you touched on uh, uh, what I was going to comment on, and that is uh, that I think one has to think um, beyond just the environment induced by the white dwarf and consider uh, the environment in which uh, this putative planet will have had to have existed during the red giant phase when of course any, any planet within sort of the orbit of, of Jupiter is subject to being engulfed by the star. Uh, but not only that, those planets beyond Jupiter's orbit will be subject to 10,000 times uh, the mm -hmm. luminosity of the sun for a, a reasonable period of time. So your initial conditions have to start before the white dwarf phase and consider the effects on a planet uh, during the red giant phase, which you mentioned briefly uh, uh, a, a moment ago. And I completely, completely agree with you. This is why I'm kind of, I'm trying to sneakily bring in the time component in all of this kind of work, right? Because that is something that will shape the environment. And so here, for example, when we were thinking about the evolution of the habitable zone through the red giant phase, this is just a picture for our own Earth, right, for the sun, because honestly, for M stars, it's not half as bad because M stars don't go through this, uh, through this pulses. So uh, if you think about that, you see how a planet would get warm, right, just for a very short amount of time here, and then uh, get cooler again, so outside the habitable zone, and then in again. And if you uh, forward this even more, let me uh, just derail this uh, by saying, what about M star plan? Because an M star, this another paper we wrote in 2014, actually, uh, if you 
put a planet at the distance where it's then in the habitable zone, an Earth's analog distance or Earth's equivalent distance, then in the protostar phase, it gets a lot of heat from this young hamster. And we, the protostar phase is actually quite long. So it's funny that for an M-star, a planet further out can actually be in the pre-main sequence habitable zone for 2 billion years before the M-star actually hits the main sequence and then it's too far out, so it would be iced over. So you could imagine that the positive spin on this is that you could imagine that life actually starts on a planet in this pre-main phase sequence and then it gets iced over and then when it gets red giant phase, it gets unfrozen again. You know, this, this is again, it's, it's, it's very much science fiction, but the evolution is key. And so there were a couple of papers that actually then very much worried about M stars being uh, capable of hosting habitable planets in the first place because of the loss of water initially, because it would get so hot. Of course, there you completely ignore that there could be a heavy bombardment, right? So the water delivery could be any time later. And there's a recent paper, really interesting, uh, I think by Nick Cohen and somebody in his team, uh, no, Dorian Abbott, that basically uh, showed that you can lock off, lock the water in the rocks for a long time in such a scenario. So water, an ocean up to five or 10 times an ocean on Earth can actually get locked in your crust. And so during uh, a phase like the pre-main sequence phase for M stars, where it gets so hot, you could actually keep that water that's locked in the rocks and when it gets cool, it can come out again. So these are really new ideas that the a geological geology community has to think through how this really could work. But there seems to be a lot of options to keep the water. So um, not for things in the inner part of the solar system when the sun becomes a red giant, because that will get engulfed. How much water you want to keep doesn't matter because you're going to be part of the sun. But for other places that get um, thousand times, 10,000 times the radiation, just uh, temporarily. And also, last point on this, it takes a while to lose all your water. Yes, you lose it to space, but you have to transport that water to the upper part of the atmosphere where it gets photolyzed and then you can use the hydrogen to space. So if it's just a temporary phase, it will take a little time, you know, it depends on the model, which uh, until you lose all the water, even until you lose all the surface water. And another thing that I didn't mention that's pretty cool about the white dwarf planets, just because we had talked about them before, is that the white dwarf planets actually want climate change as much as humanly possible because their star will actually cool. So people on a white dwarf planet, if they were an exo-civilization, would try to pollute the atmosphere as humanly possible with CO2. They would actually try to get more greenhouse warming. And so it's kind of interesting also to think time-wise in the reversal of when your star actually cools instead of when it becomes more luminous with time. I actually have a, a question related to this. It's been really interesting to hear you talk about all these different phases that are not really static from the star's perspective, right? The red giant phase, the pre-main sequence phase, the white dwarf, maybe a little bit slower, but all these phases where the star is evolving relatively quickly. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have thoughts on what those time scales would tell us about life if we discover it in those environments or or if you think you know some some environments might have evolution that's too fast for for life to really get going so i think one of the things thank you for the question that i wanted to point out is i've shown you a lot of kind of weird or extreme cases but as always in science the extreme cases is where you learn the most if you just basically make it 10 percent more or less wet there's not many surprises in there, but when you go to a very extreme case and try to think through how a planet reacts or what, how the environment would react to it, I think this is where you learn what physics you don't understand and what you have to put in your models or put better in your models. And so your point is, is a very interesting one that we do not know how long it took for life to evolve on the earth, right? We know that it was there about 3.5 billion years ago. That's where everybody agrees on. So uh, the common number is about 750 million years in the geology community, but that's how long it takes for life, like in the Earth, to get started. But we're having a big problem there because it actually coincides the first signals of life that we have in the rock records coincide with the late heavy bombardment. So there is the argument that keeps going up and down is that life actually started much, much faster. 
And so if you go with that, you know, if you go with 750 million years, then uh, you come up with what time frame you need for life to get started. Um, if you go with less, then you have more phases where it can be. However, I think one of the other things that we really don't know, and so the Origins of Life Initiative at Harvard has fantastic work on trying to figure out how life uh, could get started. But we do not know, and this is one of the key points about the evolution of life, is did life get started? It, it just needs to get started in one pond or on one place on the bottom of the ocean, right? And then it can just inhabit the whole planet. So if it can be somewhere on the bottom of the ocean in a black smoker and doesn't need UV, right? We think it needs UV and should be on the surface, but maybe it doesn't. Then you have basically um, changed the whole playing field because now you can ice over the planet, you can put it wherever you want, you, know, you can put as much radiation on it, you can put your Europa and sell it is, you know. Uh, can it start on icy sheets that swim on top of water? That's another idea about the evolution of Earth. And so your question about how long, you know, you want that phase to be also is really nicely linked to uh, the star. Because if you go for an end star, like the, the Earth didn't have the problem about water depletion because the pre-main sequence phase for the sun is so much faster. For an end star, it's really long. And so for an end star, also the red giant phase, A, is going to be forever in the main sequence phase, of course, kind of forever. But <laughs> the red giant phase is like creeping along happily, you know, <laughs> and it's not giving you, and then it's just going to cool out. So the white, uh, the white dwarf phase should also be okay, except that it's getting colder and colder. Um, so we know so little about life that I think if you just consider subsurface environments as a viable option for the emergence of life, that most places, whatever the radiation on the surface would be, could be habitats, as long as you don't want the life to then be on the surface. And again, there's the problem about remote detectability, because it's not on the surface if it's on an ice layer in an ocean and the gases don't come out. There's no way I can see it remotely if I can't go there and drill a hole through the ice. So all of this is bundled into, we want to be able to actually spot it remotely. Okay, I think next, uh, Anna has a question about planets around white dwarfs. Thank you for this wonderful talk. This is very thought provoking indeed. Um, and maybe to, to pivot a little bit of, uh, on my question as, as we've talked kind of a lot about uh, the kind of the, the, uh, the evolution of kind of habitability uh, and life uh, through the life of the star. Uh, so I guess my, my original question was, um, Kind of how is the the white dwarf search progressing and if you're able to target with tests uh, white dwarfs of different ages and if you expect that to theoretically um, kind of give you some clues as to what the kind of population of, of uh, planets uh, would be uh, in, in such systems and whether you can get some clues as, uh, regarding life based on that but I think more generally it also holds um, I, I was struck by this number of the 600 um, habitable ozones uh, discovered or uh, tracked in tests, and so not discovered. Kind of, uh, just we 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 looked at mm -hmm. we've looked at stars long enough that we should find those plants. Ah, uh, I see. Because of the orbital distance. Sorry. Thank you very much for bringing this back up because this is one of the going fast through it. It's just the amazing thing is that we actually have enough data in the test mission. What's what's great, right? To mm -hmm. have found or to have seen a planet in transit three times around 614 stars out to the equivalent orbit of Mars. Now, wow. the signal to noise is another question. Mm -hmm. Then there are some uh, gaps in the test data. That's another question. But these mm -hmm. are our best targets for follow-up. So basically, this is what the uh, TUI team is now really looking at trying to find those planets. Sorry, so, but thank you for clarifying it. So this is what I should say. We have 46 confirmed planets and 1,800 TUIs, but a couple of them are actually already in the so-called habitable zone. So we're very excited. And uh, quick question, quick answer to the other one. Yes, for tests, we're looking at all white dwarfs that we can 
And so how many a, is that? Sorry. Oh, actually, there there is quite. A, so sorry. Yes, there's actually quite a bit. There's like within I think forty parsecs. There are about a hundred. You know, I, I might be a little bit off, but there's um, there's quite a few. And so the one that I showed you that Andrew actually found the, the giant planet mm -hmm. on with, with the test team is about 25 parsecs away. So it's not great. You know, they're much better ones. <laughs> they're much closer <laughs> ones, you know? So we're basically looking at all of them and that 20 second cadence that that test now has will help a lot because a habitable planet or a planet in the habitable zone around a white dwarf has about a two minute transit. Mm. Because you know this thing yeah. is not very luminous, so this is there's also ground-based searches, right? And now, um, I, I think now because uh, Andrew and the test team have found uh, this this giant planet, now I think this is all like easier to get time again and trying to find it. Mm -hmm. And so, in your point, yes, we definitely want to get like a population if at all possible, because even with Hubble, you can actually do the atmosphere of these things, right? This is like right. not even, but you know, even to so Hubble, JWST, we could do that. And one of the things that's just really interesting that I didn't know before it, I did this work is that you can't get the mass through RV for a white dwarf planet because there are just no lines. It's right. So the mass, you actually have to get differently. And they did it with Spitzer for the giant planet. And what they did is they basically said, okay, if we would have been more massive than this, we would have seen it with Spitzer. Mm -hmm. because it would have actually had enough radiation for us to see with Spitzer. And now with Spitzer out of the way, we are just hoping that there's going to be planetary systems. So we can basically use a synchronistic time of variation to get the, you know, there are other ways too, but mm -hmm. polluted by dwarfs is probably going to be better. But that's kind of really interesting other mm -hmm. aspect of the search about planet around white dwarfs that I hadn't appreciated before because we're like, so then you did RV and Andrew was like, uh, have you ever seen a spectrum of a white dwarf? I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> and so it's kind of interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But again, what I really like in this, or, or what I think is really important is this interdisciplinarity. Because, you know, as, an astro as astronomers, uh, we, we understand the stars and their environments and their evolution. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, modeling planets has to come in there, modeling life and how to react to different kinds of radiation or light. You know, um, there's this whole set of adventures that I didn't talk to you about because I was running out of time, not running out of time, like on a <laughs> very, very deliberate, not putting it, but life on Earth is completely different and changed through time. And so this is just mm -hmm. one more slide. Mm -hmm. Remember, like things like the tardigrades that survive pretty much everything. How do you find the tardigrade? Well, tardigrades are bad for climb, but there's a lot of life that's extremely colorful in extreme environments. So then what you could do is, so we have a database, we started the database for these kind of different lives from extreme environments. Then you get these kind of colorful planets, you know, whether you get them is a question. But if one of these life forms would be dominant, so when you walk through Yellowstone, you have all these different colors, yeah. you know? If you had a planet that was just a little bit different, I think one of the key things is also to think about that doesn't have to be green trees. <laughs> that doesn't have to be green grass, you know? Yeah. And, um, but we already have a wide variety of other kinds of life that we know that we just usually don't think about. And so this color database for circular reflectivity or color catalog of life, I think is helping us break out of this other mold that we have, that we think about life very specifically by looking around us and seeing only very specific kinds of life. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, for sure. And so, so kind of to, to tie it back to, to how we started, like around this path of uh, kind of a population, how many do you think we, we would need like uh, this? Uh, interesting occurrences to, to be able to kind of convince ourselves that, that uh, we actually have detected life. Uh, so you're pointing out something very, very tricky, right? It's like, and I think it's really, really good. Extraordinary discoveries, extraordinary evidence, right? Yeah. So when we're looking at these atmospheres, and I didn't get into much detail, but the combination of oxygen or ozone with reducing gas like methane, is our golden fingerprint for life in the atmosphere so far. And what that means is just if you have oxygen and methane, they react over a couple of reactions to CO2 and water. And so the key point in that is if you see it together at the same time in the atmosphere of the planet, 
that tells you something has to currently produce the oxygen in huge amounts, because if not, it would have already reacted with the methane to CO2 and water, and you wouldn't see it anymore. And that is our idea of, so, so if there's a lot of oxygen and this is not too hot a planet, because then you can split the water and create the oxygen, and the planet isn't completely CO2 covered, because then you can split the CO2 and create the oxygen, then we don't have any other explanation than there to be in life. So we're extremely conservative in this. Of course, there's a really interesting debate, right? Because I'm promising, and, and as it should be, if we find the first signatures of life, even if it's the golden fingerprint, we should throw all of our skepticism at it, right? What else could it be? Could it be volcanism that we don't understand? Could it be this and this and this? For example, phosphor and Venus, right? Phosphor in the clouds of Venus now led to lots of people actually looking at these models of Venus, looking into the clouds on Venus, looking at where this could be, you know? Uh, and that's, uh, that's very healthy. For the Earth, the good thing is that we understand the Earth. But what about if it's a 10 times the mass of the Earth, two times Earth's system, you know, where we don't understand the geology completely, where volcanism could be weird. I think what's really important is that we get wavelength information. There's not mm -hmm. one gas that you should look for. Or, you know, even if the combination of oxygen and methane or ozone and methane is going to be the golden fingerprint of life, you need to know what the CO2 is to say how much of the oxygen comes from there. You need to know what the water is to see how much of the oxygen comes from there. So it will be a potpourri of evidence, right? Okay. But whenever somebody sells you one gas, <laughs> you know, this is life or not life, there's a challenging assumption. And that assumption is that we understand planets well enough to identify one gas without its, uh, its surroundings, without understanding its surrounding well enough as a unique life indicator. And we haven't found any yet that uh, that would speak to. And again, like the phosphate on, uh, on Venus, super interesting, right? But it could be geologically or the methane on Mars, it could be not life. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of these gases can be not like, especially when seen in isolation. So um, there's where we have this discussion with SETI people. Usually they're like, well, mm -hmm. if somebody says, hi, we're here, nobody's going to argue, right? <laughs> especially if the message is in English, right? <laughs> has to be the language that we understand. If we have oxygen and methane with water, you know, we'll have an amazing telltale sign of life on this planet. But, you know, yes, we'll throw all of our skepticism on it. It's like, is there something else we don't know that could generate that? And that's mm -hmm. what we should do. But I think we're going with something that we cannot explain other than for life as our best evidence. And long question short, how many planets do I need? How many planets does it take for one of them to make life? Maybe it's all of them, right? Then it's mm -hmm. going to be easier. <laughs> Maybe it's one in a thousand that we're going to have to keep looking. So let's see. I think this is also why TESS is so important because it gives us these new hundreds, mm -hmm. tens, yeah. hundreds. So we have close by ones that we can scrutinize. Very exciting. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I think we're probably close to wrapping up discussion. So I, I guess I just want to ask you if you have any, any closing thoughts you want to share. Uh, we can give you a chance to to Ooh, yes, share I can share whatever you have for the last two or three minutes. Okay, I can share one last adventure that's really now going far out. Okay, so because you wanted some ideas that actually spark. So when we did this database of reflectivity for life, we came across different kinds of life. It, it's incredible the diversity of life. If you're an astronomer and haven't done biology, it's incredible the diversity of life that's out there on the planet. So that uh, goes without saying. But one of the things that people were very worried about is actually this high UV radiation of an M star planet, right? And so we looked in with some biologists about what life can do or what life does on the earth to actually mitigate harsh UV radiation. And so most of it, you go under the surface of the water, you find, right? Water blocks UV radiation. You go under subsurface, you find blocks UV radiation, but hard for us to find in the first place. But what we found, what's really interesting, and this is work by one of my postdocs, Jack O'Malley James, um, we found that there are some corals, when you hit them with UV radiation, that's when you go diving, you should have a blue UV light so you can see the beautiful um, 
biochar underwater. I learned that. So next time I ever go diving, I will bring one of those. But the important part of this is that actually there's a coral and we do not know how it does it. That's actually pretty interesting. You hit it with UV light, it will break down the UV light and re-emit it in visible light that's not harmful to the algae that it lives in symbiosis with that would get destroyed from UV radiation. And so now if this developed on the earth where it's not critical, right? We don't have that much UV radiation. We also don't know why these corals developed this. There's a lot of other species that also do biofluorescence or bioluminescence, but this one is the specific point that I wanted to make because we found it by thinking about high UV radiation. So you can see them actually in some of the aquaria, in the deeper aquaria where they have like black lighting. You can see some, this is not a greatest picture, but some of them here are actually fluorescent. And they fluoresce at a specific wavelength. And so this biofluorescent signatures, this idea that uh, we came up with, again, far out, but that we should be um, not, not thinking about biosignatures that they're not uh, in our daily life. Because if there were a life, so biofluorescence evolved lots of different times on the Earth. So if you were a planet around that M star that has this UV flares, then it would be in your favor to develop a similar strategy. And the great thing about that would be that it would be a timed signal. So what I wanna leave you with is this idea that there would be this harsh flare from a young active M star. And then a little bit later, the whole planet lighting up in the visible. Whether that exists, I don't know. But it's important to not be constrained for all of your work by what you know on the earth currently. To think through mitigation strategies that we have or life has developed here on the earth and see if such mitigation strategies could be beneficial of planets that are in a completely different environment and whether or not they, they leave signs that we could look for. Well, thanks for leaving us with that inspiring <laughs> Yeah, that's really amazing. <laughs> and now you should go and write science fiction stories, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, if you have any great, if you have any ideas or any other questions, feel free to, uh, to just send me an email, you know? I'm sorry, I'm not there for coffee. I wish I were. Uh, I promise I will come by uh, once we are allowed to see each other in 3D again, and then hopefully we can have a discussion on many of these different aspects. And I want to say it's super nice to see everybody again, you know, so uh, thank you for the invitation and um, I hope it stirred some thoughts. Lisa, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. Bye. And thank you to everyone on the call. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa.